Hello everyone from Tony the Scout Ghost. Have you ever wanted to put an object in your Oculus Quest application so that it stays fixed in a real world position, whatever things happen? I mean, if the user changes the guardian, the user recenters, the user closes the application and relaunches it, if whatever he does, the object stays in that physical position no matter what happens. So there is a new feature of the Oculus SDK called Spatial Anchors that allows exactly that. Uh, it works by analyzing the environment of the user and detecting the position you have chosen to put that object and so being able to track it, whatever it happens, even in different execution of the applications. It can be very useful, for instance, to get an application about post-its. So you want to put a post-it on your PC and the post-it must be there always, all the time, whatever happens, so that next time you enter the application, it's still there. So we're going to see today how to do this kind of magic. Special anchors are amazing also for what they will be able to offer in the future. So seeing what has happened on Arcor and ARKit, most probably it will happen that in the future, Oculus will let us uh, share special anchors. So I me mean, and you have the same special anchor and we can put objects in the same position in the real world. Or we can upload it to the cloud. So it can be also uh, have um, cloud storage about the anchors and so detect these anchors may be uploaded by someone else in our environment and so have a shared experience with people from other parts of the world or things like that. But for now, they're just local on the device, local on your space. And I have to warn you that special anchors are still an experimental feature. And this is important to know because uh, it means that probably in the next times before it official update, official release, there will be some updates that changes a little things in their implementation. So this means that probably in some months from today, you will have to adapt slightly what I'm telling you in this tutorial. But usually as it happened for the past two, it's something like that 10%, 15%. So. I guess that 90% of this tutorial will still be correct and you have just to tweak little things. But stop, let's stop talking and let's start implementing. So let's open Unity and add a new project with the latest 2020 LTS. Now it's 2022, so I switched to 2020. My previous videos were, were, were with 2019, but now it's getting too old. So um, let's call it Special anchors test. So let's create it. And now let's just do the usual initialization for all the Oculus projects. So let's start by immediately switching to Android. So we don't have to do it later on when there will be more resources to reimport. And I guess it will be very, very fast. Let's go to the player settings, change the company. I mean, this is not super necessary, but I like to do that. Let's switch to linear color space. Uh, it's always more beautiful to use linear. Plus it's better when we will want to activate the pasto because it is a requirement. Uh, let's switch the minimum API level to Oreo, API level 26. For now, we don't change the backend for Mono to um, IL uh, to CPP. Uh, I know that it's one of the requirements for the store, etc., etc. But uh, building for Mono in you know, my piece is like five times faster. So, <laughs> uh, since partial anchors still work also with Mono and ARM v7, let's keep it for most of this tutorial, so it's faster for you to build also. The rest is more or less okay. Uh, let's activate XR plugin management also here. And these are the usual stuff that we always do for every Oculus project. So I'm not doing it very, very 
slowly and quite fast because it's always the same things, you know. So I activate Excel plugin management and now I select the Oculus and Android tab because this way uh, we can build for Oculus Quest. I can also add it on Windows, on PC, but now it's not necessary for this tutorial. So let's close it. And now it's time to import the, the Oculus plugin that I have already installed, so I should be able to find it in the package manager already. I have to be careful to have at least the version 35. So I look into my assets because I've already downloaded it. Otherwise, you can get it from the asset store. I already the Oculus integration, see that I have version 35, so no need to upload it. If you have a version like 32, 43, please, you have here a button saying update, upgrade or something like that. First update, then import and click import. If you don't have the Oculus integration in your assets, you know, you can look for it on the asset store. Uh, I guess you already know how to use it. so. I'll not show you how to use the asset store. Uh, in the 2020, the asset store is only online, so it will take you to the browser. If you click on the asset store here, you look for Oculus, uh, you find the Oculus integration, you click on import, and it returns to Unity, and you can import in the package manager. So it's a bit of a mix. So let's see what to import. As always for these features, it's never necessary to import all this stuff. That It's a long time to import all of this, so we just need the VR folder and this file if you want. So technically, once you know how to do, how to do everything, you can just import this way. But, uh, I strongly suggest you, if you're first time using this kind of uh, application, this kind of feature, to also import the samples for the special anchor. So let me just for a moment uh, show you. Now I'm compressing all the directories. You see that there are lots of samples, and here you are the ones of the special anchor. So in the sample framework usage, you have lots of stuff that teaches you how to use many features that are also the ones on the special anchor. So please select these two ones called special anchor and special anchor.unity and import everything. So now we're going to import all the features of the Oculus integration that will help us in building an application and also to add a special anchors to it. So if at a certain point you ask this question, Oculus Utilities Detector, new Apple game, blah, 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 yes. Use OpenXR, yes. All new features of the Oculus SDK require OpenXR. So use OpenXR, okay? And then it will ask to restart and you have to say to restart, yes. So we are back in Unity, we have now everything we need in our project for now. We have the sample scene that we will modify. Let's add open scenes. So we add in this scene to the build for the future. Uh, notice I will do all the sample with the VR camera rig, not to with the open XR. So with the, sorry, with the XR rig of the um, XR interaction toolkit and Unity XR. But I guess, as always, you want to use UnitXR, you just have to import uh, to add the um, XR rig and the OVR manager to the same scene and disable the cameras of the OVR manager, as always. So this sample can also be used if you use UnitXR, you just to be careful to remove the stuff. So let me show you in a second. So if you click this disable I anchor cameras, you can have all the functionality of the VR manager, uh, but without cameras of OVR manager. So you can also add your Unity XR rig here in the scene and all the rest applies as before. So it should be something very, very similar. So for now, I'm not covering this case in the video, but if you may need it, 
by tweaking a bit the stuff you should be able to do that so uh, what are we going to do now um, the first thing that we have to do I added this camera rig I want it to be at the floor level for now so even if it is in the origin I will set the camera at my real height and basically that's it for this scene I have if you want I can also add you know a, a figure in front of me just to have a frame of reference like a big cube let's make it I don't know two meters wide or one on the top and let's move it I don't know, four in front of me just to have a frame of reference so or is the phone direction let me I will show you why in the future so then what you have to do is to activate the special anchors so for now special anchors are activated this way you have to do in experimental activate experimental features and activate the special anchor support here I'm in the over camera rig OVR manager if you have not seen it before and there is this model called quest features where you can modify things about the quest and in the experimental tab for now there is the way to activate the special anchors i guess in the future it will be somewhere else maybe in the general or will be another tab called i don't know special anchors or whatever so now that we have done that we have enabled special anchors we're using openxr we're using um all the necessary settings to do that we have activated this so we're ready to use special anchors but before actually building something for the special anchors for now since an experimental features we have also to activate experimental mode on the quest so let's take the quest and we'll connect it to the pc and activate experimental features via side quest Okay, you can see in the little window that I have a red cable connected to the Quest. So I connected the Quest via USB to the PC. So now let's open SideQuest. I will do that with SideQuest because it's much easier. So let's go to the device settings and tool tab and let's activate experimental mode and click on on until it says it succeeded so the first time it fails because there is also adb open in unity so the two adb is goes in conflict i click again on and the experimental mode is on if you don't do this even if you develop everything correctly on the quest the application doesn't work with special anchors because it's experimental feature and if experimental mode is not enabled the runtime doesn't let you use experimental features so now it's correctly set so we can close side quest okay back to unity so let's start by doing this application in steps so i want you to arrive to a point where you have the application where you can put two different kinds of anchors one with the left controller, one with the right controller to different kind of objects. And then uh, you can keep them consistent across se sessions. So uh, you can add some spheres and some cubes and these objects are coherent every time you open the application. And then you can also remove them. Even if you recenter, etc., etc., they remain always fixed in your place. And in the end, we also add the pastel and most probably the cloud anchors they do their best with the pasto um, feature so that you can really put object in the real world and see them in that real world position with the real world images uh, that says everything that are coherent but let's go step by step um, i will also show the code just by giving you uh, the full code uh, that you have just to copy and paste basically so i will not write the code with you and the reason is that i find that uh, first of all it was pretty complicated to write all the code with all the comments so it would have been pretty weird to write it together with you so this way is not prone to errors it's already made and checked etc but i will comment it with you and i will show you the evolution of the code so that you can understand what i'm doing so let me know if this approach was good for you because maybe you prefer that someone codes together with you but i think that it's 
more efficient this way. And also the code that I will provide is not meant to be perfect. It's meant to show how to do, use this feature, to teach you something, but maybe you can still optimize it. You can <clears throat> make some refactoring, etc. That's not the point of offering something perfect. It's just to make you learn. So that said, <clears throat> let's start making our application. As I said, step by step. So, so let's add another cube in the scene. Cube, uh, let's call it uh, object one. And put it at 0, 015 in scale. And make the collider a trigger. Then create another object called a sphere. Let's call it object two and the same 0.15 and trigger so what i'm going to do now is to drag this to the resources folder and create a resource object called object one and the same for object two uh, this way these will be the two objects that are going to spawn in our application so they're pretty boring <laughs> the sphere and a cube but i mean that's enough to showcase the application. And then let's move this under the left hand anchor and the right hand anchor. The idea is that um, you see on your hands what are the objects and when you, so you know what you're going to generate and where. It's like a symbol of what you're going to generate or something like that. Uh, probably I should make this a bit semi-transparent so that to be cooler, but I can also leave it this way as you prefer. Okay, let's create a material so just to make happier and uh, let's call it semi-transparent. Let's put in a folder of materials, materials and put it here so materials folder have the semi-transparent uh, material that is not opaque is transparent and as an albedo that is probably 0 0.5 no this way this way okay and let's assign it to the two objects dragging it it's easier so we should have these semi-transparent objects that basically are like the brushes. So you have them in your hands, you see what you're going to generate. We'll, and you understand in a while why I created it. So basically now we have created two objects in my hands and two objects that can be generated that are very similar, just the ones in my hands are semi-transparent. So now let's create an empty object let's call it special anchors manager that from the name you know it will be super cool so let's create a folder with the scripts <coughs> and then in the scripts folder let's create a script called special anchors manager so until now is nothing special Let's open the special anchors manager and let's start to do some little magic. So <clears throat> now we start with the first iteration of special anchors manager with a link. Remember, I will put some paste beans link here in the description so you that you can understand, you can copy and paste the code from there. Basically, it will be pretty easy to do that. So let's start from the first version that we'll find on paste bean of this special anchors manager. Okay, I pasted the code and basically what it, what it does mean. It's super easy. It is an update method where I ask you the runtime. Is the user press the trigger on the left hand or the right hand? If yes, generate the object. So the generate object takes uh, <clears throat> a bool about the controller that has, about which we want to generate an object because the primary uh, objects in OVR input are the left hand, the secondary ones are for the right hand. So if the trigger one is pressed, generate object two because it's for the left hand, otherwise it's the right hand. And this code here 
Just the first one asks the runtime to get the position of the touch controller in the tracking coordinates of the quest. Every object in the Oculus integration has a tracking coordinates. That, so this is a reference system of Oculus, basically, that we have no idea what it does mean exactly. Uh, we don't care because there are methods, these methods of extension to a space that transforms to that transforms to workspace. So basically I take the position in uh, whatever coordinate system and have it in workspace or in Unity reference system. And after that, we just load from the resources uh, the right object name, depending of the left or right. So if it was a left controller, load object one, that is the cube, otherwise object two, that is the sphere. So Left hand can create cubes, right hand can create spheres. You may wonder what, where are the special anchors here? And the answer is, there are no special anchors. It's just to show you the first iteration of the application that generates objects. Uh, we'll add special anchors later. It's just to show incrementally how the application builds itself. So this is just standard Unity Oculus code. We returned here to, um, to our application. We have created this magical object. So go to our script and move our special anchors manager script here. So we have just added our fantastic logic to the scene so that we can create cubes and sphere. Before building, remove the main camera, of course, because we have created our OVR camera rig. Then save the scene, save the project, and let's go to the build settings and hit build and run to build our application. Let's select a location. I create a bin subfolder usually. Many people create build. I'm more like a CPP, C++ side. Let's give it a name and hit save. And it will build and run the application on the quest. Okay, so we are in our fantastic application, the big cube in front of us to semi-transparent brushes and then I click and when there is the brush it creates either the cube with the left hand either the sphere with the right hand super cool so let me show you this way and so we have a way to draw in our application so it will be pretty useful quite in a little time so we have our first version let's try to add special angles to it Okay, so I've returned back to here and I've pasted the new Spatial Anchor Manager that you can see is a bit longer, but don't be scared, it's still pretty easy. So the manager now is a bit more complex, but also more efficient. So let's analyze it. It's full of comments. You see that there are lots of green areas here so that you can understand it by just reading the code. And there's also a lot of error management, so don't be scared, it's pretty easy actually. So the first thing that I did, some kind of, you know, to make the code tied, I created a data with um, a data structure with information about an anchor. And every anchor that we will create will have a handle that is given by the operating system the name of the prefab in the resources to generate, we created object one and object two. So every anchor will be associated with a cube or a sphere, basically. So object one, or object two, two name, and the reference to the game object instantiated, because you know, we have the name of the object in the resources folder and then the, the actual game object generated. Let's stop for a moment to talk about the space handle. Every anchor is referred in name either as anchor or space because it defines a reference space. So that's why it's also called space. So sometimes in the docs or in the samples, you see a reference to one of the other. The handle is the unique number that identifies um, the space or the anchor. Uh, in current execution of the program. If you have developed or something like, you know, uh, Windows 32, or you know a bit about C or C++, etc., you know that, for instance, when you open a file, the operating system has a handle to that file. It's like a, a number. They say, okay, this is the file number 
7372 that we are currently open. The operating system uses the name of the file, the actual path, just the first time when it has to open it, on uh, finding it on the file system. And then after that, the file is just a number that identifies the ID of the file in that moment, in that current execution of the OS, uh, so that it can be identified. It's the same as special anchors. So the handle is a unique ID for this session that identifies this anchor. And it's a number that only the operating system knows what it means, and we simply don't care. We can imagine it as the name of the anchor in this current session. So for every anchor, we just need its name, basically, and the type of prefab to create on it, and if there is already an object instantiated in it. Then I use the object1 and object2 name as constants, so that it's more tidy. Last time I was just written them in the code. And we define the invalid end handle uh, as basically minus one. So it's a max value of a U long that you know, since it's unseen long, there is no negative, and the negative is the max value. So this IT concepts, if you uh, don't know them, don't care, we just know that the handle is invalid if it is the max value of U long. And then we hold in memory what are the anchors we created, and it's a dictionary with the ulong that is the handle and the anchor data. Anchor data contains the handle as well, but I prefer to do it this way, even if the data is repeated between the key and the data, so that everything is in one structure. So at the start of the program, we create this dictionary, and then here there is an interesting stuff. So in the enable and disable, we register to some events of the VR manager related to the anchors. We'll see that it's always this way. The anchor management is usually asynchronous. We want to do something with anchors. We ask the operating system to do that. And the operation takes its time to complete and we get an answer with a callback that usually is in the VR manager. So we have an event, we have to register for everything we do with special anchors, basically. Not everything, but like 90% of the time, yes. So we register for this set component, we'll see in a while why. In enable and clean up on disable. Then you see that the update is very similar as before. We we'll wait for a trigger, and then uh, if we press the trigger, we do something, but we don't create the object before we have the generate object. Now we generate a special anchor for controller. And we can start digging into the code of this method. So as before, we get the pose of the controller in workspace. So this is pretty interesting. Oh uh, no, actually no, it's different than before, sorry. We just take the pose of the controller in the tracking space of OVR, of the Oculus Quest. We are not taking it in world space. We don't need it because anchors are in the reference system of the Quest, not in the reference system of Unity. So we need to create an anchor just with the local position of the Oculus Quest reference system. So. Uh, the Oculus Runtime has its own reference system, centered in the headset, etc. We just take the controller in that reference system, the pose of the controller. And then we create an anchor. To create an anchor, we call the method special entity create special anchor from OVR plugin. And you have just to provide some information on how to create it. So the time, that it's always this value, OVR plugin get time in second. What is the origin type? And we just take the one of Oculus and the pace space, the posing space in this tracking space, that is the controller pose we got before to pose F. This pose F uh, is a bit complicated. Basically, as much as I understood, um, the, Ocu the Unity reference system is left-handed, while the one that Oculus uses inside is right-handed. It's pretty normal because we all that have studied geometry we all use a right-handed systems. So there is there are these methods with conversions between a left-handed and right-handed. So we just take the pose of the controller in one reference system convert to the other. We just you just have to call to pose F and you're right with that. 
there is an extension method offered there is both the one this back and forth methods to create from one to the other so we just create this and we're taking okay let's call it in the controller pose that we just got here before uh, to create uh, an anchor there then we ask the runtime to do that and it will put the handle of the anchor in this ref value notice that this is one of the few calls that write once immediately so this doesn't need a callback because it will be a mess if it will be a callback so it write once immediately and gives us a space handle uh, if you want you can check if the handle is okay or not but as you want so we add this anchor to the created anchors dictionary our data structure and use the space handle since it's unique for this session as the key and we get if they use one object or the other to generate the cube or the sphere depending of the easy left parameter that we called here so we told it in the update if it was a left or right controller and also here we got the right position depending on left or right and then things that we can be trickier here so we have to add a component to the anchor and you may mean what does it mean uh, well you know that unity is uh, works with the entity component system so basically every object is an object they may have behaviors while well, special anchors are the same they're entities and you can add uh, behaviors so it's an entity component system in an entity component system you can imagine the x bit you know your dog meme uh, added here because it's basically what happened um, so you can imagine the anchors are something that define a space in your a position a pose a rotation and position in your physical space it also may have some behaviors and at the moment the behaviors are true we'll see one now and the one is locatable and this locatable behavior means you can track the anchors you can know where it is and it's obviously something you want to add because otherwise the anchor is useless basically you define oh this position in the world space in the world in the physical world is an anchor and then that's it you don't know where it is in your unity space so it can be totally useless without the locatable component so we are we are forced to add it and to add it we have to do a double operation at first we ask the runtime if this if this component is already enabled so we get give it call this method special entity get component enabled provide a handle ask what type of component the locatable and ask it to put the resulting component enabled if the component is not enabled we ask to activate it with the set component enabled that is similar parameters you can see it also requires to activate it or not uh, request it blah 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 and if this call is asynchronous and this is one the one that we registered here you see special entity set component enabled and you may notice that this is a callback and when we receive it there is a request id result the type of component and the space handle so the the answer uh, the thing that we do in both cases is the same generate update the object for anchor so if the get component right on set the component is already enabled call this method otherwise do the set the set will call this a callback when the set operation is complete if it was okay generate operate game object for anchor so we have a coherence in the two behaviors that's why i create this helper method <coughs> and just the last thing this request id when you do an asynchronous request you can specify request id and you put it in the call here and you will file the same number in the callback so you can identify uh, the callback associated with every call in this simple sample we don't need it so we will see that in every call that i will provide you requested is always zero and i basically don't care but in some applications it can be very useful maybe you can 
do some kind of requested the add or requested the for the cubes maybe one the requested the for the spheres maybe two and you get this id in your callback so you can you know that one was called for the cube one of the spheres and many different things so it can be pretty interesting but at the moment i don't need to use the request id <coughs> and uh these are the the methods that you have to call so remember that this is asynchronous and notice that they add a lot of check with log error blah 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 you can dig into the code and see why it's so big between the comments and all this log error so final things is so if we have the local table component already enabled a start and usually in this moment this is what happens in this moment if you launch this code it always returns through here and you always go here uh, notice that the return value of this method is not if the component was activated if it is the call was successful it's an error code so that's why if it didn't succeed we log error the return value is in the output component enabled <clears throat> and uh, usually in this moment you always arrive here we never call the set component enable i don't know why it is already enabled by default i mean i know why because if it is not enabled the anchor is totally useless so let's uh, see what is in this method so in this method basically it's very easy so we uh, create we create uh, the um, we created the anchors here. When we create the anchor, when we create the anchor, we also create an entry in our dictionary about the anchor. And now we check: Have we already instantiated an object for this anchor? If the answer is no, we created loading it from the resources. Um, that's pretty straightforward. We only do that if the anchor is a locatable. If it is not a locatable, we can't track it, so it's useless. So we don't create the object. So you don't see it in the scene. Mm -hmm. What we do later is call the OVR plugin locate space and get the position of the anchor of this anchor in the reference system of the Oculus. Then we convert it to workspace with this usual method of air extension to workspace, and then we assign that word pose or so position and rotation to the object we created so what we basically doing is okay we create an anchor it is locatable we take the object we had to create the sphere or the cube <coughs> and we create that object then we get the position of the anchor in world space as so in unity reference system and we move the object we just created, the cube on the, or the sphere, in that pose. So in that position and rotation of the anchor. This way, the cube and the sphere will be in the exact pose of the anchor. So we'll be completely associated with it. We'll move exactly in that pose of the space. So after all of this, basically we can create anchors and have a cube and a sphere associated with an anchor, depending if we created it with the left or the right controller. You may notice that the output of this application is the same of before, but notice that we are not creating the object directly like before, before we're like, okay, you press the trigger, you create the object. Now we're like, you press the trigger, you create an anchor. And if the anchor was correctly initialized, you create an object with its same pose. So it's an indirect creation. We can see that if the output is the same, everything worked. So we were able to create the anchor successfully. So let's save it. <clears throat> and once we are here, we can just build and run and see our application on our quest. As I promised, the application looks similar to before. But if it works, and it is working, by pressing the trigger and creating applications, it means that this indirect creation worked, so we are able to create these objects associated with special anchors. So now this object, these six objects, have a special anchor associated with them. And, but for the rest, you may notice no difference with before. Also, if I recenter my quest by pressing the, the Oculus button for some time, you may notice that all the world, including the anchors, is moving with me. 
So nothing has really changed from before. If I recenter the space, the objects they should be anchored in your in our idea are moving. Let's fix it now. So let's get back to Visual Studio where I pasted here the third version of the Spatial Anchor Manager that you can find always in the paste bin links in the description here below. So it is identical to the previous one. We have just implemented the little method, the late update method, uh, that is one of the standard methods of the mono behavior that is executed after the update. And what we do is just to we loop for every anchor we created and is in the dictionary uh, where we store them. And if it is a valid anchor, we update the position of the game object associated with the anchor, or we create also the game object if it is not created, but usually we have already created it when we add the, the locker table component. So what we do is that every frame, the anchor, uh, we loop all the anchor and we just put the game object associated with it in the position of the anchor. This means that whatever we do in the scene, recentering the OVR camera rig, moving the OVR camera rig, rotating it in every frame, the game objects, the cubes and the spheres, we move so that they stay in the position of the anchor. And since the anchor is always in the same position in the physical world, the game objects will be fixed in our position in the physical world, even if all the rest of the scene moves. So with just this little change, will have a great impact in our application. As always, let's save it and let's build and run after Unit has finished this stuff. And let's see how it is this version of the app. Okay, look, we are here in the world, it's as before. So we create three objects in front of me. And now let's see, I recenter the world in that direction. And you can see that all the world is changing, the lights. You see also the lights, the position of the objects, etc., etc. I'm changing everything, but these objects are always here in front of me in the physical world. This means that the anchors are working. Notice that also the, the, the shadows are changing on these objects because we're also changing the light that uh, is, where is the light position in the world, where is the sun? But the object stays always here. So I'm clicking recentering to show you that the real cube the cube in the Unity scene is moving because I'm recentering the headset, but its objects are fixed in the same position in the physical world as always. So this is the special anchors magic at work. And this is pretty cool. So you can finally put the objects in some position in the physical world. But now there is a problem. Of course, if I close this application and reopen it, I have lost all this information. So how do we implement it? How do we make the session persistent? Let's see it with the fourth version of the Spatial Anchors Manager. So back to Unity, back to Visual Studio, I pasted the fourth version of the Spatial Anchors Manager and this has long and big changes because I had to implement the serialization of the anchor. So I will give you a hint, always this version like the other ones, is commented a lot so you should be able to understand most of the stuff but i will give you the initial guidance so it's easier so for instance we created a dto version a data transfer object for the anchor data and um, i'll have to explain you how the serialization process is going to work because this way it's easier to understand so basically the runtime for special anchors lets you serialize the anchors on your storage but it's something that the runtime does automatically you have no control over it basically you say save this anchor for future usages and the system saves it and in the future you can retrieve it if you want so you can use it where well, you can save it when you launch the app, you can close the app, you launch the app again, and you reload the anchor. But you have not like a file or JSON, whatever. The runtime handles everything about it. Um, 
When you do that, uh, the anchor can't be identified by the handle because the handle is just an ID for the current execution of the runtime. As I said before for the files, the handle is in, uh, the, when you open the file, I don't know, C uh, colon slash Tony.txt, maybe the handle is 7273. But that number doesn't identify uniquely that file. In different computers, you may have that number of uh, identifying other open files. So maybe on your same computer, you turn it off, turn it on again, you open another file, and that one gets that handle. It's just something that identifies in some data structure of the operating system an ID of an open file. In this case, for the anchors, it's the same. It's just an ID of the anchor that is unique for this moment that says to the operating system where to find that handle in its data structures. But it's not a unique ID. But anchors can have a unique ID when they're saved to this, also when they're created. Basically, the unique ID is something like uh, those big uh, sequences of numbers and letters like hexadecimals, strings, like the product codes, etc that are quite long and are unique. It's a UUID, if you are a developer, probably you have already found these IDs. There are long strings that are unique among all the systems because they're so long that the probability that two that are generated are equal is really, really little. So an anchor have this UID and UID is the same forever and ever and unique for this anchor. This is like the path of the file. On your PC, there is only one file called c colon slash tony.txt. There can't be other files with the same exact path. And here, more or less, is similar. It's even better. It's really more unique, even probably unique among all the anchors of the world. It's like, this is the ID of the anchor. The, where you can identify it forever, even on the cloud, on your uh, Oculus, etc. So this is the difference between space handle, anchor handle, and space UUID. This is very important because it took me a while to understand it, but now that I understood it, it's quite easy and makes sense and makes understanding all the serialization process easier. So when we serialize an anchor, we have to save its space UUID and the prefab name. Basically, we can't serialize the game object because the game object is something that uh, references an object in current execution, not something that we can serialize. But we can serialize the prefab so we can regenerate the same kind of object. The rationale is this one. <coughs> Basically, I want to create the anchors as before then from the anchors create the serializable representation with the UID and the prefab name, save this thing, and then an next execution reload it. But what is the problem? The problem is that I said the serialization of the anchors happens uh, automatically with the runtime. So we have to serialize every anchor in two different ways. The serialization of the anchor itself will be done by Oculus, the Oculus runtime. At the same time, I will serialize these DTOs on my data structures. In this case, for the sample, the player preps, because they are super easy to be used for the, for a sample, they are perfect. And serialize for every anchor, what is the object to be created. At runtime, when I reload everything, I will reload the anchor, reload what is the prefer to be created, and recreate the exact object when the program starts, so that I can reload everything about an anchor, like if it was created with a controller. So we'll see that in details, but that was the project. Um, you can see that uh, the start method starts by creating the dictionary and then trying to reload the anchors of the previous sessions. But I will see the method later and enable and disable, we have new callbacks, new events to which we register. One is the uh, storage save that is happens when the anchor has been saved by the runtime. And now the other one is the carry results 
that is useful when you load and you want to query what are the anchors that have been saved to disk. So this is more or less similar as before. We have the controller, we have the late update, you see that updates the anchor, and we can create an end for a controller. Notice that for some refactoring, now I have created new method, initialize special anchor. And I did this because this way there is a bit of refactoring. So we can uh, call this method in different parts of the code. So the rationale is this one. Uh, I can have an anchor that has been created by the user with the controller that has been created by uh, the program when it reloads the previous anchor. So it's useful to have only one method to initialize the behavior for an anchor. So add it to the created anchor dictionary and add the locatable and storable behaviors because this has to be done for every anchor that gets created in a way or in another. And you may say, hey, Tony, what is this is storable component. And that's the first part of um, the, the interesting stuff of this um, class. So we're talking about the locatable component. So you create an anchor and there's a behavior that can be found. It can be tracked. But now we want also to store it to the storage. And if to do this, we have to add another kind of component to it. So it must be storable. If the, app, if the anchor is not storable, you can't save it to the persistent storage. So it's just a temporary anchor. So when we create an anchor, we have to add the locatable and storable component. And here we have done some refactoring again. So before we had just one uh, component, so we can just hard code the locatable addition. Now we have two, and so I have created a method to add whatever component. And I call this set anchor component, and basically it adds whatever type of component, checks if it is enabled, checks for the errors, etc. etc. And then I did something quite smart. Since the OVR manager has a method that is called as an event that is called when the set component enable is successful or not, but anyway, it completes that we registered here. Remember, when we set the component, we receive this callback. Uh, what I say here is that if I call this my method set anchor component, if I do a get and the component is already enabled, I call the callback directly. Otherwise, I ask the runtime to call the set component. And if you look into this method, probably not this one, but, uh, when this method, sorry, when this method is called, um, it is an asynchronous call, as I told you before, the runtime does its stuff and then calls exactly this method again because we registered for it here. So it said when the set component is finished, call this callback. So basically we have two different paths. The first one is let's see if the component is enabled. If the answer is no, then we call the set component, the runtime does its stuff, then calls my callback. Otherwise, if it is already enabled, I just call the callback myself because this way, whatever I do, I always finish in the same method. And what I do in this method is check for errors, blah, blah, blah. And then I say, okay, if I was asking for the locatable uh, component, that is also the first one that gets uh, requested, create the game object. So, as soon as I add an anchor with the left controller, it is locatable, put the cube in that position. If I was asking for a storable, so I say, okay, I want to store this anchor, save the anchor immediately to disk. And I'm doing this save anchor immediately, it's a choice of mine, uh, so that I don't have to implement a menu when you add all the anchors and I say save all. It's just that you can add the anchors and they are automatically saved. And then when you exit and re-enter, they're there again. This is a choice for this application. It's not necessary. If you want to implement like a save command, 
you don't have to do this of course you can call the save anchors when the user selects as many so basically we have done this operation that until now is pretty straightforward we we ask a new component that is a storable one when the storable one gets added by the runtime, I receive this callback and I call save anchor. Save anchor is a method that I created to save the anchor to the storage. So, uh, but as I said, I can't do it by myself. So I just ask the runtime, special entity save special entity. It's stupid method, special entity save special entity. I don't know who chose the name, it's terrible in my opinion. And I have to say what entity I want to save given the current handle and the runtime and specify where to save it. At the moment, it's only local on the device. I guess in the future, there will be the cloud for how much time it should be persistent. And then the user requested it that I'm not using. When this method has been uh, called successfully, the runtime processes it and returns to me a callback. And the callback is of VR manager special entity storage safe that has the signature and basically returns the user request ID, the handle we're talking about, if the result was successful or not, and the UUID. So, okay, I saved your, your space, I saved your anchor, this is its UUID so that you can refer to it in the future. And if I, in my application was, I was just generating cubes, probably I will not need to do anything here because I just need to save the anchors and that's it. But in this case, I have to use also something to remember if it was a cube or a sphere. So what I'm doing here is to create, as I told you before, a data transfer object for this anchor with the UUID and the name of the prefab that we have to generate for this anchor, a cube or a sphere. Notice that here I'm using this helper method get UUID string that I took from the Oculus samples because the UUID is a collection of true um, Ulong numbers. If you look into this tract, it's not a string, it's true Ulong numbers. And that's pretty not uh, that comfortable to use, not practical. So there is this method in the samples that converts it to a string. Basically it's a two string method for the UIDs. Maybe you can also get an extension methods with a two string for that class, but I just took the code and that's okay for that. So I transform this to in a string and because strings are much more manageable. And then I create the data transfer object where I associate the UID with the type of object to create. I transform this in a string, in a JSON string, so that I can save it more easily. Uh, and then I save in the prayer path um, a mapping between the current space UID and this ob serialized object. So long story short, I'm creating a player prefs a mapping between the unique ID of the anchor to extract with the data about that anchor. So I serializing the current info, everything I have to associate to current anchor uh, to the unique ID of the anchor. In this case, what we need is basically just the prefab name. So I could have just put a string here instead of this DTO. But I wanted to show you this, so if you want to add more data about this anchor, I don't know, an animation to trigger, a scale, or whatever you want, a user associated with that anchor, you can just expand this DTO and add information, and all this behavior works. You convert it to JSON, and you associate it to the player prefs. Another thing that I told you before, the prayer paths are easier to be used, but actually you can also use a JSON file and save all the data of all the anchors in a dictionary uh, serialized into a JSON file on your quest. So, um, with this operation, as I said, when the runtime stores the, the anchor uh, in its storage, we also save in the, our storage and player pref the data that we want to associate to the anchor. So in this case, sphere or cube. And so the save operation is finished this way. Uh, we can save 
all the anchors as we want. And if I run the app this way, I could save every anchor every time, but I'm not loading them, I'm just saving. So how we load them? As I showed you in the start method, we had this load anchors from previous session. So let's see the code. Uh, to load the anchors, you have to um, do a query with a runtime asking, tell me all the anchors that you have basically. And to do a query, you have to create the special entity query info struct with these parameters. Most of them have just one option now, but you can choose the location, local on device on the cloud, load the anchors or not, uh, kind of filter that is important. Uh, we are now specifying no filter. So we're just asking, give me all the anchors because what I want here is I started the application, I want to see all the anchors that were in the disk, uh, in the storage of the quest. But this same query info can also be used to say, okay, I want to just know that anchor. I know the UID for whatever reason, and I want to just have the information about that anchor. Where is that anchor? I can still use the same methods to do that. At this moment, we don't need it, but there is a sample also in the Oculus file. I'll show you it in a while on how to do that. So we start the program. We say, give me up to 50 anchors that were uh, in the space. And we call this special entity query, special entity, again, a stupid name uh, to solve this query. You may guess this query are asynchronous and you get an answer in a method. And the method that has called the callback is special entity query results. The user requested it, and then an array of the results of the query. And here, this is a pretty weird. You have an array, but you have also num results. I guess this is because of, um, I guess it's platform invoke or some native methods. So in C, usually you write on an array that is like, made with a big dimension and then you have a number saying what are the valid entries in that array because you have to uh, store um, the over capacity of the array basically uh, in c++ this is, this is totally useless so i don't know why they're doing this i guess that they're just mapping the values returned by the native call in c so you see this weird structure it's not much C sharp, <laughs> this, this callback is very C like. So you have the results array, but only the first new results entries are valid. Uh, so we just take all the values of the query and the values of the query are just, uh, they give you both a space handle and the space UID. Since we specified in our query also to load the anchors, the anchors are already valid. So we are not only making a query say hey tell me something about this anchor we're also loading it we're creating the tankers so the system uh, let me show you again where i put this remember action type is load we have to load these anchors not only telling me something about them but also loading them so this equals this operation where I received it to make a lot of create anchors and have the handles. So we just take the results and we have a handle, every UID for every anchor that has been obtained from the query. Then if we had the valid anchor, uh, just take from the player prefs what was the data about the anchors that we saved before. So before we saved all the data in the player preps or every anchor in entry with this UID. We have now the UID of the loaded anchors. And then as, as I've said, the UIDs are unique. They don't change, they never change. So we can take the same UID that we used in the save operation to use it in the load operation to get the data of that anchor from the player preps. And once we have the data, from the player preps, we can get the prefer name, so it's a sphere or it's a cube, and we can initialize the special anchor exactly with the same method that we did for the controller. Because now we can initialize, add it for the created anchors, and we can 
add again the locatable and storable component to the new anchor that we've loaded because we've just loaded it we don't know if this is locatable if this storable so let's add again this component so the anchor that we loaded becomes completely identical to a, an anchor that we got from the controller and since remember that when we added the locatable actually we also uh, moved the cube and the sphere to the position of the anchor we see the spheres and the cubes in the exact position of the anchor even when we load them so basically we are creating a common path if you create an anchor with a controller you you create the anchor and then uh, use the data basically you, you create the anchor with the data of the controller and then you put a cube and sphere there and make it locatable and storable if you load it you get the data of the anchor for the storage and then the same you add locatable and storable if you move a cube or a sphere there so it's the same thing just starts in a different way uh, and that's it uh, basically it's over this way all this code means only that uh, you can see that's only a matter of understanding some basic concepts the difference between space handle and uid the fact that you have to call the methods and wait for the callbacks or the runtime to be called and the difference between the data st stored for every anchor by the runtime that is basically uh, how to identify the anchor in the real world so what are the parameters the features in the real world environment to find it and the data that you have to say about the anchor so they are personal data for your application about that anchor and you have to do that by identifying the anchor via the space uid once you got this concept everything is super easy so let's save it and let's see this program in execution by going there make build and run and make the magic happen with the anchors that get saved and loaded okay we are inside our application let's put some funny anchors so funny anchors so let's put it this way I've made a pretty cool smile here and as soon as I put them I have saved it uh, I have saved them you remember from my code so now I exit the application I can also recenter my headset so change its orientation I could also remove the guardian so let's do it the full thing so let's go to the developer let's also remove the guardian so i removed all the tracking data the identification data usually if you wanted to execute the same application again use the guardian data if you wanted to keep the relationship between the virtual and real world so i have no guardian data now it's only reliant on the special anchors and giant so let me relaunch it again and then fingers crossed that it works otherwise i will make a good figure and bam it has loaded again the smile notice that the cube is there because i recentered the headset there but these are fixed in my real location this is pretty cool and they are in the exact same location i put there in the previous execution of the application so mission accomplished but i have something more for you so how can we remove these anchors because now if i keep adding them at every execution i keep adding anchors anchors and anchors again so how to remove them and clean the stuff we created so let's see that so i just pasted the last version of spatial anchors manager that is very very similar to the one we had before uh, there is a little difference so um, we have created a new method in the update uh, callback in the update method we are also looking for the pressure of the thumbstick and if the thumbstick of the left or right controllers have been pressed we call the erase all anchors method so this is the new method and basically we loop in every anchor and we 
remove it. Remove it means two things. The first is called special entity erase special entity that removes the anchor from the storage. So we are just deleting it from the, the storage, the persistent storage, but the anchor is still valid in the current session. So we also call destroy space to kill the anchor totally for this session. And since we're there, we also take the instantiated object, the cubarius sphere that we created for the anchor, and we destroy it as well. So we're going, you know, from in a clear order: remove from the persistent state, remove from the current state, for the current session, and then remove also the associated game object. So visually, we remove it. After that, we also clear the dictionary of the created anchors. And we also delete all the player prefs. So we also create, delete all the data of the anchors. I made these methods, we erase, erase all anchors this way, so it's also easier for the sample that it's already a lot of info to digest. Of course, you can create also a method to destroy single anchor. So you can just take that anchor and destroy its object, its UID, its uh, current space and destroy its reference in the player prefs, just that one, and in created anchors. So you have just to decide. Now I just made one thing for all because to destroy a single anchor, I should have implemented a pointer to point an anchor, select it, blah blah blah. Uh, the anchor, the sample provided by Oculus, has many information about it. I will show you uh, something in a while. But for now, let's save. It's the only modification I got. So I build and run, and now with the thumbstick, we should remove all the anchors. So build and run, and let's play with it. Okay, I started the app, and of course it loaded the cubes and the spheres as before. So now I press the thumbstick, and they disappear. Uh, let me just add a new one, just a cube here in the middle. So I just quit the app, I reload it, and I should see only one cube now, because all the others have been removed. Uh, and that's it. Now it's probably not... Okay, you can see it now. It's a cube, we have it, and all the other anchors have disappeared. I removed it correctly with the thumbstick. And that's it, that finishes all the behaviors on the anchors I wanted to show you, but I want to give you a little more surprise, because I think that special anchors can be good in VR, because uh, you can, for instance, create a mapping between a real and virtual world, and that's amazing, but can probably be even cooler in AR. So let's add Pastel to our application, and let's see how it works. Okay, you should probably already know how to implement Pasto. If not, I can add, of course, uh, a tutorial link about it later on. So it's not an experimental feature anymore. So you have just to activate Pasto capability enables, enable Pasto, and then we add, it's in the general uh, features of the quest, the Pasto capability enable. And then we have the script of type Pasto layer, OVR Pasto layer that is already provided by Oculus. So now probably you have some problems in seeing this part of the screen. So let me just move it a bit. Uh, reconstructed is okay. Let's put it as an underlay and I don't know if put some kind of, let's put edge rendering, I like it, so let's put some Azure edges. I don't know, I always like to do some kind of edge rendering. This way you have added the OBR pastel layer. We have also to remove from here the, the skybox and let's use a solid color this way. You have to select the three cameras, clear flex, solid color, black on black with alpha also equal to zero. We have already selected linear space. So let's go to the player settings, linear space, open XR is activated. But to use Pastro, you have to activate the, uh, the ARM64 build. And I don't know why I can't find it here. Okay, so from mono to ILC 
plus plus and activate arm 64. So after all these operations, the pastor should be activated. Open XR, linear color space. I linear color space. I let you put it in the beginning. Now ILC plus plus arm 64 plus all the thing we put in the camera rigs. And now everything should work in pastel mode. So let's save and build. Now the build around will take more time. To me, there is a difference between 30 seconds and four minutes, basically. So it's a very, very <laughs> long difference. That's why I did everything with mono. My suggestion is to debug everything using mono and then switch to ILC to C++ just when the application is finished and you want to really debug it with the past to activate it. So that's my suggestion. So now build and run and let's see the magic in Pastor. Okay, so here we are inside my application. You can recognize the queue from before. So let's, let me remove everything by pressing the thumbstick. There is also the big queue. And so the magic of the anchors can be that I can put this cube on this corner of the bed. And it will always be there again. I can recenter. No, sorry, I removed it. Oh, damn it. Hi. So I can recenter and it always stays there. So I can sign the corner of this desk, for instance. Now I'm just doing it in a terrible way, you know. Oh, where is this computer? So putting a sphere here and they always be there. As I made an example before, they can be used for safety. So I can, the people can always say where are the corners of objects or can be used to be posted. Imagine here I've been posting the same bed, desk, PC, etc. And as I show you before, I can also so close my application. I can relaunch it. Even remember, I have the garden disabled. So I could go everywhere in the city because I have tracking for always and this will be always here. So technically, but I have not tried it yet. I could put an anchor like uh, in the streets, whatever, in the other room of my house right in here and keeping seeing the anchor being here. So that's pretty impressive. Of course, uh, remember when you use anchors that uh, they, of course, have a measure error, measurement error, so they can also tremble a bit sometimes. Never happens to me because the tracking of the quest is super stable, but you may notice it, especially if you add an object distant from the anchor. So you have defined an anchor here, for instance, on the bed. Now I put the cube exactly on the center of it. But actually you can say, okay, let's put a, a cube at three meters from where is the anchor. If you base the position of the cube to the position of the anchor, since the more distant you go, the more the vibrations of the anchors are visible, the Oculus runtime suggests not to put objects more than three meters far away from the anchors, or you may see uh, vibrations or kind of stuff. So the more you go distant from the anchors and the more an object associated with an anchor is distant from it, the more you may see measurement errors, of, um, vibrations or kind of stuff. But you may see that if I put an object straight onto the anchor and then close to the anchor, the tracking is then stable. So I have really an object associated with a real position in the world. And that's pretty magical because really they're there whatever happens. So you can create, you can make people decorate their rooms. I can put a lamp there, a uh, Christmas tree there. I made a video. Uh, let me show it to you now. Uh, for Christmas, I, I could put gifts and a Christmas tree in my room, and they stay there always. So they're like I could decorate my rooms with special anchors, and would be super persistent. And imagine when we can share the anchors in the future. So you can arrive here, and you see, for instance, the places that are flagged as uh, hazardous. So you don't have to configure your quest. You load my anchors on the cloud. You see what are my posts, my decorations, or the points that I said that can be dangerous because they're corners or something. And we can share them and play the same game together. This is the big superpower of special anchors. And I'm super excited to 
discover what developers will be able to create with them. Just remember for now, special anchors are only available all as an experimental feature, so you can't use them on App Lab or the Oculus Store for now. I guess in some months it will be approved, uh, as it happened with the password that it took a few months to be approved by Oculus. So this is the special anchors with password that I think is magical. I said you almost everything about special anchors. My suggestion, since you remember when I made you import the Oculus uh, package, I also like to import this special anchor sample. And this is where I learned the most about the special anchors. The other important resources is the documentation on special anchors that I'm adding that also in the description here below. So if you look at this sample, it is quite similar to what I show you, just that it has menus, it lets you select anchors, it's a bit more complicated, but it's super useful. So you notice here there is a manager of the anchors, the manager of the UI, uh, there is a prefab associated with every anchor, in this case the prefab is always the same, so you don't need to save if it is a cube, a sphere, it's always the same one. So it's this reference system and the sample is pretty cool, I have to say. Um, there are some classes that I found amazing and especially this, this anchor session is an abstract class. This partial anchor session is where you can see there's some similarities to what I did. There are some comments, not as many as what I have uh, added to my code because I really wanted you to learn in an easy way. Uh, this code is very well made. Uh, here you can see the code of the UID string that I copied. Um, there are some differences uh, in how it is implemented. You can choose what you prefer. I think it's very informative. And um, notice that uh, there is one method that I want to show you, this query anchor by UUID that for instance, I have not in my code because I don't need it. And here you can basically get the UID and get from the runtime the info on that anchor from that UID. So notice that I make the query, but this time there is a filter type that is not known but is IDs and I provide the UI, UUID info. So with this method, I query the runtime about everything, uh, about just the anchor with that UID. So load that anchor with just that UID. So maybe I don't want to load all the anchors because maybe they have different behaviors. So I have a file with some anchors with the cube, some anchors with the sphere, and maybe I just want to load the ones on the cube. Well, I can have, for instance, in my application configurations for different rooms, uh, layouts. So I just load some kind of IDs, not all the ones. So you can use this method. Here it said you query all, that is the method that I also created. So it's similar to mine, but a bit more complex in structure, this sample. So I think you can also learn a lot by reading it and seeing the structure. For instance, something that I uh, appreciate, they have a class just for the anchor with all the data about it, blah, blah, blah. So I made something very simple with just the prefab, but you can have many data about the anchor, you can have a behavior in the scene, blah, blah, blah. Here you can select the anchors, for instance. So my suggestion is to read the documentation, also have a look at this sample in the sample framework in the Oculus integration in Unity. And with this final suggestion to look at the sample, finishes my big tutorial on the um, spatial anchors on the Oculus Quest. Uh, as I said before, probably when you look in this video, something has changed it. Maybe they're not experimental anymore. Maybe there are little tweaks in the names of the methods, etc. But I guess the general functioning will be the same, like the one that I've shown. So just adapt a bit the code and everything should work. Uh, I think that spatial anchors can be very powerful. Uh, most probably we'll see more their value with when Project Cambria will be released with Pastro, Color, AR, when you can put objects in the scene in the same exact way for everyone to enjoy. You can maybe put post-its, decorations in your room, etc. 
uh, with a real pasto it can be really useful i also see its potential in local multiplayer applications i think that really special anchors have lots of potential for creators to do something meaningful for now they're just something to start experimenting with to um, to see how things work and how can be created in the future and i think that they i really believe in the potential for application especially when paired with pasto i think that there will be a lot of things to be created or some kind of thing for merging realities you know you can configure your virtual space by adding anchors in the world and then having every time you load the game the virtual objects in the same position of the real ones and this can be persistent whatever you do with your headset with the guardian because until now there was this possibility to create a matching between the real and virtual world but it was related to the guardian position and it was prone uh, to drift if you didn't have the guardian but now with the anchors you have solved this problem you have no drift anymore you can put an object there you can remove the guardians who go everywhere in your room i have the anchors always fixed there in this position so that's pretty pretty cool of course if you have any consideration any question etc please write it in the comments i'm not very fast in answering but i try to always answer if you if I can help you, I will do that. So I will be happy to do that. And you please let me know what you're doing in Special Anchors because I'm really curious to see what the community will be able to create with that. And that's it for today. So thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe. And if you want to also donate on Patreon and share this video with all your peers so that everyone can know how to use Special Anchors in their Oculus Quest application. Now I thank you again, I wish you a great day in the R&VR. Bye bye.